Who's an animal? Your mother's an animal, you son of a bitch! Oh. And hi guys, welcome back to High Lazaretto. You're here with your hosts. I'm the gentleman. And I'm Papa Smoke. It's been a little while, so uh, it's nice to get back at it and uh, get one of these done again. I think, yeah. I think, I think we're, you know, it's a, it's a, a Thursday. Yeah, a little, little Thursday. Cheers. Cheers. I've got to say, this brandy you've got on you, I've, uh, I've enjoyed a couple of subs of brandy over Yeah, we're, we're kind of thinking <coughs> what... Well, I'm thinking now, you know, I haven't really spent a lot of this lockdown drinking. I've purposely tried to avoid it. Uh, but it's made us realise that I actually kind of don't like alcohol, but I've come to realise how much I love brandy. <laughs> and I've now, this is the second bottle of brandy now. You're getting into it as well. You were, you said you were too keen nah, at first, nah, I think it's usually, I used to feel it was like perfume, but this hasn't been too bad, these. I don't know if it's you actually just, a co-op home I, brand. I don't brandy. know if you just uh, pawn good measures, but it's nice. Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah, I think with brandy you can easily put too much in and it overpowers it. You want ah, the right amount strong. of brandy, um, but it hits you when you don't realise as well, which is what I love about brandy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's been good, but yeah. So anyone that's new to listen to this, uh, this is High Lazaretto. We watch and review films. Yes. Usually me. intoxicated in some manner, whether it be alcohol or other oh. means. Yes. Or yeah. the herbal substance. Or the herbal substances. <laughs> and uh, we obviously are going through Total Films 100, most influential films of all time. Um, and we've went through so many of them now. I believe this is episode 12? Is it episode 12, 12 it is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've now agreed that we're only going to do 15 episodes on this series. Yeah, well, I'm f- we're feeling like <clears throat> there's a lot of films on there that are good, but there's quite a lot of films that are pretty stale. That I'm, I'm sure they're influential in such a way, but... The reality is, if we wanted to do every single audience. film, there's going to be a hundred episodes, and there's not going to be, uh, you know, some episodes aren't going to be as great as others. So we thought we feel like we've definitely got to a point now where we're getting the swing of this. Now I feel that each episode's improving. So now we're gonna we're gonna finish at fifteen, and then we're gonna move on to something else, which we'll re- we've got in the works, and we'll reveal later on. However, um, so the film that we watched, our number twelve film in the uh, top 100 most influential films of all time was the Thin Blue Line and this was a uh, 1988 I think it was it was released uh, yeah 1988 1989 uh, something like yeah, that yeah. late 80s and it's um, the first well we the way we picked it you kind of just winged the last uh, podcast with the selections and we just we literally had no feeling going into this about well, any it, of the really. films because we didn't even really know any much about them yeah <clears throat> But this turned out to be like uh, why it was influential was the first of its kind in a documentary style of uh, depicting a real act that happened, so say a real crime in this mm-hmm. case, yeah, in um, a real case file, and acting out like a re- uh, like reconstructions of the event, yeah, mm-hmm. acting that out, and um, then coming to it like interviews, personal camera interviews. Of like people who are involved, and it was one of the first like documentaries or films of its time to do that to get like that whole set. It's and about so, the the reconstruction in yeah. the film. Yeah, well, it's like you you would have seen a hundred uh, Netflix documentaries that are similarly influenced to this film. Yeah, mm-hmm. like I can think of a few off the top of my head, like Evil Genius, Don't Fuck the Cats. That <laughs> I absolutely love. Right, look, I, out of Netflix films. <laughs> Like so, this is the thing. That in today's episode, what I want to talk about is what I feel makes a good documentary. And the films that we've watched because of this episode, I feel are a great template to understand. Yeah. Especially if you're a filmmaker yourself or wanting to be one to, and want to make a documentary to understand how to do that. Now, with Netflix right now is the dominant thing with documentaries. You know, Netflix is bringing a new documentary out every day, and for the most part, I'm obviously a bigger fiction th- fan than a documentary fan. But when a documentary is good. By God, it hits. And I remember watching Don't Fuck With Cats. Yeah. And within the first scene, the first kind of, the introduction to it, I was instantly attached to it. Well, Instantly this is, attached. Well, this is what I mean. It, even in this, they did a, like, from the off, I was hooked because of the intro. Mm-hmm. And it was shot so well. And it's like, it does, I didn't know about it, obviously, this film at all. Mm-hmm. Then when I, obviously, I'm a fan of documentaries. I love quite a lot of documentaries. I watch a lot of, like, Louis Theroux and... Any kind of documentary you're, you're, stuff. I consider you quite a documentary kind of yeah, stuff. Every time I walk into the house, if I've been out, nine times out of ten, you're sitting watching a documentary. I mean, albeit sometimes it, 
it, it's usually a prison documentary, but you yes. you have a broad pl- palette as well. Yeah, I, it's. I mean, I just to suck off at any kind of documentary to be fair. Yeah, but I've got my own theory of why I like documentaries, but I'll go into that a bit later. Anyways, but obviously Netflix has such a range of documentaries. It's where I watch quite a lot of my documentaries. Yeah, and I seen the style. And I always liked the Netflix style documentaries, and I was like, I wonder where they would get, where they got the idea to do that. And until I watched this film, I realised. Mm-hmm. how they're just like like you say if you follow that structure of creating obviously a real life event that's got real hardcore facts that people can be interested in yeah and then obviously given visual aid through like reconstructions keeps your mind occupied and like fresh and it's like well, there something that yeah. visually stimulate you really while you're watching it and it's such a good way to do a documentary because it keeps you fresh on the focus points with the interviews of mm-hmm. people giving live facts and stuff yeah, and then the reconstructions is like a soft like stimulus to your brain. Yeah, I mean, there's 101 different styles of documentary. Um, you know, if but for the predominant part, a generic type of documentary does comprise of a bunch of interviews, and you could very easily just go and film and interview these people, and then just cut those together in the edit in an interesting way that it tells a story in a good way. Um, but what reconstruction does really is kind of for me, anyways. If I sit and watch something and it's just a bunch of interviews, I do get bored, regardless yeah. of what's being said. And for me, reconstruction's always been a big thing because yes, people think reconstruction is instantly that very tacky, you know, like oh, well, police drama, yeah. like you know, it's like See, oh, like and then he watch. entered the door, dun, 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 like, like crime watch some guys, yeah, going, rah, 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 like, yes, hundred percent. Very poor. Well, it does it does sit, lend itself into a lot of. Who are documentaries? You'll see a lot of shoddily constructing, like construction, reconstruction events, and it's like a simple way to get a point across because you don't, can visually show someone a lot more, and you can tell them about it in like a interview. Absolutely. So yeah. it's like a sh- good way to get your point across, but it can be like a lot of low budget documentaries do, so it kind of gets spoiled. But when someone does it really well and mm-hmm. pays good attention to it, and really makes you feel like you're there. You feel a bit emotionally tied into the story it's, that's getting told. Yeah, I think, look, if you're making a documentary, the first thing that's the most important thing at any documentary is what is the documentary about? Do you have a character that's really interesting or do you have a subject matter that you care very much about and you've got a bunch of like official people or people that have very particular opinions about this matter? Um, and nine times out of ten, the documentary forms in the edit. Like You've got all these rushes of people talking. You've got them decide how do I cut this and how do I tell a story? Because, you know, you could just do one interview after the other, but what good documentaries do, and particularly what The Thin Blue Line does, is it chooses each... It splices all the interviews together in a way that eventually tells the story in the correct manner of this crime that's committed, which is, of course, the shooting of a police officer. Um, And this film, for anyone who doesn't know, was directed by Errol Morris. He's basically one of the godfathers of documentary, along with Werner Herzog, two that I love very much. Um, but this documentary did so well to kind of show this case of this police officer being shot that it actually overturned a sentence. Well, this is what we're saying. It's a uh, like you say that any uh, anyone who has watched this film before, the like basic storyline is that this drifter ran out of gas, and this kid uh, who had like a well later gets revealed he had like a troubled past picked yeah. him up. And they just went on a bit of a cruise and just went around like they watched a few movies, got drunk and that. Yeah. And then one of them shot a police officer out of a car or just off a routine stop because they like had a busted headlight or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one of them killed him in cold blood. And this whole thing was revealed that who to blame? Well, they blamed one guy, which was the drifter. Yeah. Allegedly, and he was sitting on death row waiting to be. Uh, Obviously, convicted of the crime, so he's waiting for his sentence. Which you see in the film, he, yeah, you uh, see uh, him there. You see him the, he's all for those men. on death row. Yeah, but this other kid obviously grew up a bit as time passed. He committed another murder, mm-hmm. and he so he was already in jail. And while in jail, at the very end, like there's a little bit of a confession telling them, basically admitting that he was the one that did it, not the drifter. Yeah. So after the fact that this documentary came out, the, you know what? Was called yeah. for a retrial and stuff like that what, once again we're watching a film that and um, what we found with quite a lot of the films on this list is that we're watching it and you admire it because it's the first one to ever do that but in our day and age we've seen 101 films that have been influenced by it 
and do it in a different way or a better way in some ways because they've worked on this original master plan of the film and what I loved about this film two things I loved about this film was that visually it didn't look like it was old it still stood up par with Netflix films but also it was it was still jaw dropping and you know when we first opened the film and it was about a police officer being shot in my head you know even though it's about you know I know it's going to be a great film in my head I'm thinking right this is another police documentary that I've probably you know, it's probably going to be the upteenth one I've watched um, you know let's see how that goes but the fact is that it it did so well it overturned at the end and at the end it, you know you're watching all these interviews and it cuts to an actual tape recording of this other character admitting that this person is innocent and I think that's what's so good about this film and I think that if you're serious about making documentary films that you need to consider is this film went to make a difference it had a message trying to show everyone this person is innocent and he's been you know kept wrongly and they actually changed something and some of the best documentaries I've ever seen are those that bring light to many serious situations that people didn't realise which is some of the films we'll talk about in a bit but for me again looking back at what makes documentary films good Firstly, your subject matter. Also, the editing process. Take a lot of time into how you want to construct that. But also, as a director in documentary, your biggest job is to interview people and get the story out of them. Yeah. And what Errol Morris does so well in this is that he's talking to officials. He's talking to prisoners. Yeah. And yet he's getting the kind of response he clearly wants from these people. And it's because he knows how to talk to them. Um, Louis Thru's you've said many times Louis Thru's a master craft at that isn't he well yeah well I feel when you need to exceed like you say that is the basis for a very good documentary what you're saying you get yeah. your facts mm-hmm. you get your interviews in you get your stone all the facts you recreate it so that an audience can digest them facts yeah <clears throat> if you stick to that you're winning every time mm-hmm. and you're good so even if you say you're interviewing the person you're just asking questions and you're getting like a each time they're just telling you a story or event or giving you an answer yeah i feel like when you step above on a documentary is when a true documentarist or a documentary filmmaker should i say they make a yeah. really good standard they let the person kind of interview that cell in a way yeah i feel mm-hmm. like you was well well Louis Fru's good at just he just has a conversation, he'll just get you comfortable. Yeah. And he'll have a conversation with you and he'll just bring up stuff that he wants to talk about, but most of you're just talking you're basically just talk revealing yourself what you want yeah. everyone to see. And if you're comfortable enough you'll reveal quite a lot about yourself, mm-hmm. I would feel given the chance. This this is something that I've always felt uh, quite true in making a film. And we were saying, well, obviously because we're so excited with this film, mm-hmm. we went and watched another film. Uh, the Act of Killing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that is something else. When we are talking about next level. Me- like, next level making a difference, but allowing interviewers to interview themselves. Yeah, it's yeah. a very meta thing. I mean, quickly finishing off with what we have to say about the Thin Blue Line is, uh, you know, that character, the person that actually did it, yeah. the amount of effort that the director must have went through to make that guy feel comfortable enough to be able to admit that for a start. But also when you first watch the film, my only criticism of the film is it didn't have name tags for people, so it did take me a little while to get into who was who and who was what. I, well, I would f- feel like that's something they must have learned in later. <laughs> later on, yeah. Um, so, like, that was very helpful in all the other, like, Netflix, yeah, well-labeled, well-labeled yeah. content. Absolutely. To see what's and going on. I think that it, the two things he does best is that he, the way he edited it together makes you think that that guy is such a likeable guy. And he is. The, the guy that's actually... You know who did the crime, or yeah, at least the, it's perceived the, like, to. Loose. Yeah, he's like kind such of. a charming young man. He he's very. He's he doesn't seem intelligent, but he knows his limits of intelligence, and he sits comfortably with it. Um, and so he works really well with that editing, putting that together. And again, the reconstructed stuff it gives you a chance to be cinematic. So even if you're not a documentary filmmaker as such, being able to understand uh, visuals and being able to tell a story in a more deeper sense. So Errol Morris chooses a lot of shots of like, when it's talking about being interrogated, it's always just cut into an ashtray with cigarettes. You know, they're not cutting to people yeah. saying lines or generic shots of people, you know, talking. It's showing you this moment in the, how stressful the situation is with the person. He goes through like two packs of cigarettes. Um, and so, yeah, I think this film, you know, watch this film and understand that it is like a master template 
to make a good documentary. Most Netflix documentaries follow this, I think. You know, in that the way oh, yeah, you tell the story, the, I definitely see the inspiration. Definitely, I remember when I was yeah. watching it, I was like, "Where did they get that idea?" But now I've seen it. Oh, any out of any documentary that could have been on that list that we picked, I'm glad we picked this one. Yeah, that definitely. was fair. I really enjoyed it. I really highly regard it as a very mm-hmm. good documentary, to be honest. Yeah, I was watching documentaries like this. Yeah. I re- I remember when I was when I was making a short documentary myself. What I found so important, um, I was doing a documentary about uh, ship yard workers, shipbuilders, mm-hmm. and talking about a very kind of uh, personal moment in their lives in which they witnessed someone die in the shipyards, because at the time there wasn't really any health and safety, so a lot of accidents happened, and a lot of men uh, have seen things that are quite harrowing and quite scarring, but of course they've, they're have older now and they've built up these stone-cold walls, so from watching these films, it made me realise that I have to find a way to get these men comfortable to be able to talk about this particular moment and actually show how they felt about it, rather than being you know, this toxic masculinity thing of I can't talk about it. Yeah. Um, and it's films like this that it inspired me to be, all right, I'm going to try a different approach to speak to these people. Because if I act just as me, I might get a good interview out of people, but you're not going to please everyone. And Louis Theroux is a, com- a comedian. He kind of, you know, he changes himself well, that's what per I mean. person gotta, to get just, the best out of them. He plays just, dumb sometimes, gotta, he plays smart. Well, when I was saying, my whole... Uh, theory of why people love documentaries so much and why it's such a wide thought after category and it's literally regarded a doc- great documentaries regarded in such a different way a great film is yeah mm-hmm. because I feel secretly everyone does like a scope into the other side of someone's life I feel everyone would like to like be a fly on a wall in certain situations yeah, and in certain aspects, and just see life from a different perspective, and a documentary gives you that. Mm-hmm. It does, yeah. And it gives you that view truly of someone. A great documentary will give you what it truly feel like to walk in the steps among them people and live in that culture or whatever it happens mm-hmm. to be, or in that moment, or just understand truly what is being documented. Yeah, and I feel like to be. To seize that moment, literally, the saying you've got to be a fly on the wall. The documentarist or like the film documentary filmmaker has to be that fly. Yeah, and I feel that's what he does great in a uh, like blue for all will just adopt and be that fly on the wall. And let a situation happen in the same mm-hmm. way. In that act of killing. Yeah, he did the exact same thing, and it produced such an amazing documentary because it's basically he was there, but he wasn't really there. He was just the, that fly documenting these people. Yeah, in a sense, just doing what they wanted and expressing their way. That's it. So we were so excited when we watched this, uh, The Thin Blue Line, that we ended up talking about our favourite documentaries. And I mentioned The Act of Killing, uh, released yeah. in 2012, directed by someone called Joshua Oppenheimer. Now, this film is fucking huge. And what you're saying there is so right that you have... So what Louis III does quite well is being that fly in the wall and adapting in these situations. But there's always been this argument with filmmakers that you'll never get a true documentary because the camera's there. Someone's yeah. behaviour will always change when the lens is there. And it's all about realism. However, what The Art of Killing does, it's such a, a meta film because it's a film so aware of itself. And the trick for this is that he is... So it's set in Indonesia. Um, you know, in 20... It, it took years for this film to be made as well. He, sp- he moved to Indonesia, did a lot of research, oh. got close to the right people, and that takes time. Yeah, yeah the people he's interviewing. Like 12 years only all together. Yeah, 12 years all together trying to make this film, and he's interviewing uh, these old men who were given power as gangs in villages of Indonesia in the, to it was like murder. In the it? When yeah, the- in the 60s, uh, you know, they wanted to eradicate communism. So the government would hire, you know, gang members, thugs, to go around and kill these people. And Joshua Oppenheimer spent so long getting these contacts that he's now in a room with these men and can talk about the atroc- atrocities they committed and see how that's affected them. Well, all time. these men now are like very powerful men in this community that mm-hmm. live because of this, and it's like all ran on like a fear of who these men are, but they're obviously in the later stages are not obviously these men anymore because society's moved on and yeah they're still dangerous men to a sense but they're not the men that were and they're all a lot older and themselves still and like but if they're not in that some must be in that 70s to like that mm-hmm. 60s yeah. they're all like an older generation of men well, that's and it's it. just 
he's allowed them to make this like their film depicting these acts in like re- reconstructions like you yeah, say yeah, but they does. are doing all these reconstructions themselves he's basically give the power to them to say you depict this how you want to depict it and I'm not going to influence you and say you need to make it look like this and that and that's yeah. very smart because that's when you truly see their psyche and how they perceived it well, this is this and is it was what such this a film twisted does so way well. that they saw it as all like a lot of them just saw it as like movies, yeah. Because of the like the cinema and it was such a yeah. I mean, it, I mean, some brilliant scenes and brilliant scenes, some jaw dropping scenes, and it's all to do with this idea of realism when making a documentary. You know, you'll never get full realism once the camera goes in front of someone. But what Josh Oppenheimer has done is that he's took the this concept of realism. And turned it on its head, where he's not just trying to interview these men and you know prod them and get something out of them. He is now filming them make a film, and so what we're really looking at is these men having to witness what they did and reflect upon it in a way where you're kind of watching the scene evolve as it's happening. So most documentaries will interview people after a murder has taken place or an incident, but we're actually watching these events unfold and these men having this. Some of these men are having realizations through of these what, reconstructions of exactly. what they've done. Yeah, yeah. It's such a very. If you really think about it, I don't know. I would like to know if he truly meant it. They have that kind of reaction, or he just said that he thought of that idea and it just provided something so great, and he was just there to capture it. Uh, yeah, I'd love to I'm know not, how he got into I'd, that situation. I don't know in how. The first he, place. I, I want to know how he got in the situation because think when you think about that on such a good level when we were saying about reconstructions in documentaries yeah. and how they can show you something maybe words in an interview can't him mm-hmm. telling yeah. you so he's made them realize their actions by having them actually physically act it out and think about how the person on the other side felt because yeah. that's how most of them broke on that it was just because they were playing like because it was such a low budget film yeah they were, they were playing, playing the like the victims as well so they had yeah. to go through these horrific torture scenes because they made it quite gruesome yeah, and it was like, um, like a lot of them just realized and thought like, there's one scene where he says, uh, "Is this how my victims felt?" Well, and that's, he, that's, he, and that's the, the only scene. time, ah, the only time he ever reveals himself, this Joshua Oak behind him. It just he literally says, "Well, no, your victims actually felt a lot worse because they actually did, died, and you just made a fi- you knew you were making a film." Yeah, and that to me shows that this director here. <laughs> had finally almost withered these men down. And you're watching horrible things. You're watching men talk about raping children yeah. and laughing about it so casually. And then through these films, uh, one particular person that he's uh, following, he gets him in such a vulnerable moment because he played a communism in a few of the scenes and wow. got his grandkids to watch it and his grandkids didn't like it. They didn't like the idea of watching their grandfather get hurt and he realised that, that he suddenly breaks. He has this moment where he's he's so aware of what he's done and the director finally steps in and asks this question, says this, you know, answers this question to him. But imagine if he said that when he first met them. Ah, he the would guy would have had his head chopped off like straight ah, away. He had to build that that's trust. What, that's what's beautiful. Yeah. One of my beautiful scenes is it's quite a long documentary and it's right at the start of this film there's an interview on this spot where he used to just like rack up because these guys used to just kill them like assembly lined. Yeah, and look like communists they were just one after the other so much so that they have to have, they have to have a system of how they could kill them quickly and like well a lot of blood which is disgusting when you think about it but yeah so he's describing this how he would do this method of disposing of these people and then um, at the start of the documentary he's doing a jig he's like laughing about it and showing doing the, a little dance isn't he yeah and he revisits the spot about 10 minutes from the end of the documentary and has the same kind of interview with him and he's sick he's physically he's, he's up. actually being sick he's being he? sick he's cowering he can't speak it's just the man is like a completely different that, yeah. human being that he witnessed over this course or however long this uh, and documentary lasted. that is real realism and that's that what woman I mean. there is and realism what, and he's what, mastered the art of documentary filmmaking because yeah. he's captured the moment as it's happened not just retelling it and that's what I feel is the next step on a documentary is that you can have that yeah. basis like you do in the Thin Blue Line I'm not saying Thin Blue Line isn't perfectly done 
mm-hmm. well done, and it gets a point across, and it was got me ve- had me very interested throughout. Yeah, there's a few things I didn't like in it, which uh, I didn't like the way the female cop got portrayed. But I mean, that was of its time and of the yeah. It I mean, also it, it's her bosses that made it. Ah, made it's it's not like that. the documentary making a bad. It's just what it showed of his PRs, and that's not to yeah. say the documentary's fault. It's just the warped view of them people in it. Yeah, but, 100%. Any, but I was like, I was saying, that's great in the fact that it does that. It, like, mm-hmm. it gets that point across and it kept us hooked. But to truly, like, repel, like, appeal to a different level of documentaries is, you've got to capture that moment, like you say, you've got mm-hmm. to turn it from just a story being retold into an actual physical moment of realism that you've captured. Yeah, and that's when you become like a film documentary film I feel that's what sets it apart. That's it. I would advise anyone that has that wants to make documentaries or is interested in them, is to watch the Thin Blue Line and then watch the Act of Killing, to understand the best way and some of the most effective ways to make a documentary. There's certainly other ways to do it, but just again thinking about rule number one what's your idea what is it you're talking about you don't want to just you know make a documentary about Kells you want to make a documentary <laughs> about people about stories about things that are happening things that are happening you then of course rule you know you then have to try and get your interviewees your subjects <laughs> try to make them as comfortable as possible and then finally of course thinking about the go. you know what is it you're wanting to say but also trying to find that realism Trying to find that moment in your story in the film where you're actually capturing something developed as it there and then as it's happening, you know whether there is a change in the subjects and the way you'd speak to them, um, or if it is as you're interviewing someone something strange happens. Um, when I first started doing films, I got uh, to put on a task to take a camera and film bus stops around Newcastle. Yeah. And so I had to sit at this bus stop and I would have to make conversation with people. But they didn't realise I was filming, which ethically is a bit odd. Cause, but of course, I didn't put it online, I didn't put it anywhere. It was just an experiment for myself to understand how to interview people and how to get stuff out of them. And it yeah. was a horrible challenge because I remember just being so nervous, going, I'm going to have to speak to strangers. And not only that, I'm, I'm sitting next to a huge camera attached to a tripod. You know, like, right. it's not that I'm going to be a normal person that could just have a little bit of chit chat over the bus stop. I'm that weird guy with a camera. And they're like, well, why is he speaking to us? What's he want? Um, And I remember I'd spent all day at all these different bus stops and everyone was a bit, you know, offensive at first, defensive at first, didn't really want to talk. Some did, but they were very aware that there was a camera behind us. And although I didn't tell them it was recording, I think, you know, it's there. You can tell if it's going to record or not. And then I remember I was just about to pack up and I was just, you know, thinking, I was trying to make this documentary at the time. And I thought, oh, I'm just, maybe I'm not cut out to make documentaries. And then out of nowhere, this guy walked up to me and started talking to me. And it was the strangest experience of my life because I had questions I was asking people and I was trying to see if I can learn about them or at least about the their backstory, about them as people, yeah. rather than just yes or no questions. And I started talking to this guy and we talked about his family and you know where he come from. Uh, he was originally from Jamaica um, and he moved here for like 25 years. Um, and he had some children and we stopped talking and he stopped and looked at me and said, thank you for this. And I, I was like, well, what do you mean? And he was like, you made me realize that I need to ring my daughter. I've not seen her in so long and I miss her. Oh. And I caught that moment on camera and it was just looking back at it, being able to see this person, I wasn't just... This person wasn't just answering my questions and giving me information. I really got to see into his soul. Yeah, that's what you this capture change. in these documentaries. A true, yeah. great documentary will capture a true moment of someone's soul. And that, that's what you look for. That's what you. That's why everyone kind of wants to watch documentaries and wants the kind of people watch when you just people watch and yeah, people will of course. just sit mm-hmm. and people watch. It's because. You want a little glimpse of their soul. You want that true little moment of like what their life is. Just because you're curious, everyone's curious what life is about. So I guess the more life you see, the more you understand. The more you learn, I think. Which yeah, is, uh, and that's what's great about the documentary. Part about filmmaking in general, but especially documentary. Um, but yeah, the, the, that's my list of what I think would make a good so, documentary. Well, how would you rate this documentary? What would you say? Now, for the Thin Blue Line, I would rate it a, a solid 8 out of 10. Yeah, 
Yeah, what about you? Very well, 7.5, I was going to say 8. Yeah. Although it's not on the list, I have seen The Act of Killing before. It's actually my favourite documentary of all time. I want to know what you would rate that out of 10. That's so high, you know. I really thought that was one of the best ones I'd watched. That is my favourite documentary now. I don't think I've seen a documentary that's been better. Yeah. For me, it's a 10. I think, or at least a 9.8. Like It's very, I would say it was a 9 for me. Yeah. 100% it's really, really good. And it's so, some of the stuff that gets touched upon on over that. Yeah. It's an epic, to be fair, because it's like two and a half hours, so it's like an epic. It is, of, yeah. Of a documentary. I mean, it's check out. Well worth it. Yeah, you need to check out Josh Oak. Uh, you need to check out The Act of Killing. Um, even if you're not interested in documentary filmmaking, but just to understand something so that's been kept in the shadows in the Western world that's been going on over Yeah, there. I didn't even know about that. Like I say, I've yeah. never, it's never something that's been taught as that part of the history of like, yeah. that part of the world at that time, and it was very interesting. Yeah, 100%. It. Yeah, I mean, it's he's got a set, as I said, he's got like a second film, so he made he interviewed and did so many different things while he was there. I mean, now he's not allowed there. And in fact, how harrowing did you find when you saw the credits? Yeah, anonymous, anonymous, anonymous. It's like very... so many people put their names as anonymous on the film because they knew if these men had found out they were a part of it, they would be killed. Well, that's another thing that makes it so great as well. I feel because it's very selfless. Mm-hmm. It's like a story that needed to be told, and they told it no matter the cost. Yeah, and that's very admirable. Yeah, admirable. it is respectable very... on any level. Um, but he's got a, a second film uh, come out, so instead of the act killing. It's the look of silence, and I've, I'm very interested. Yeah, in I would it, definitely. Yeah. If you like that, killing, sure. check that one out. It's all the extra footage he did following a different person, um, but you know, still very much in the same world, doing the same thing. Um, but yeah, so that uh, you know, that's a thin blue line, or at least just the entire genre of documentary by yeah, the sounds well, of it. I felt like I don't think we're going to get into our documentary, so we, we want to cover our work. Yeah, hundred percent. That's what we yeah. thought, anyways. That was where thought process I guess it's got me open to watch more documentaries again and you know I'd try and start looking out for some of the big ones um, but yeah I guess the next stage of, the, of this uh, right. of the podcast is here in the f- three films you've picked out and then I have to pick one to be our episode 13 we only have, have three more films that we can pick before we're finishing this series yes so I've went very in that in mind I've went big big no matter what you pick I'm going to enjoy Okay, right, so you made so sure there's films that you like. Yeah, right. I'll make sure it's films I like, films I would like to review. Yeah. And just naturally decent films. Okay, right, lay it on me then. Right, so first in, we've got a tank top special of Bruce Willis's Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something about Die Hard. I didn't even, I never watched Die Hard until like a year or two ago. Fair. <laughs> yeah. you know, do, you, do you like it? Well, I mean, well, it's I it's one of my favourite Christmas films. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> then we have, well, since it is the last couple I thought, since we've done a little bit of a two part here, The Godfather Part 2 is in. Right, okay. It's in this list of total films, 100 most influential films. We watched films. the first one not well, that long ago. Exactly. And so I'd like to watch the second one. I haven't like, seen it. Um, I was like that, and we could maybe finish off with the third. The third's not so good, but if you want, if you felt like you wanted to review the trilogy on a whole, yeah, could be a possibility. Yeah. I and mean, that'll be a long haul. That one, that's that'll be that longer is, than watching the two Blade Runners. <laughs> long haul. This one. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? What's the third choice? Well, in that total film, it says Lord of the Rings is in a whole. <laughs> So I'm keen to watch any Lord of the Rings or the trilogy or right okay. just <laughs> review them in general because we've probably seen them a lot and or just review watch some scenes. Right, I mean, I definitely would like to review Lord of the Rings at some point, anyways, because it you know we're currently watching them with my son. We made him watch The Hobbits. Yes. Recently, and he loved those. Well, that's what I was thinking. We could even because your son does. Arrive tomorrow. If yeah, he wants, <laughs> if, he wants, if to. he wants to watch a Lord of the Rings, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got Lord of the Rings. I've got Die Hard, and what was the second one again? It was uh, Godfather Part Godfather Two. Part Two, or Part Two and Three, if you would like to. Now, always thinking that I'm challenging my palate and 
changing my ideas. I have a bit of an outlandish thing to say, and I'm going to leave it'll leave this podcast on a cliffhanger. This is the film I'm going to pick, by the way, but I'm going to leave this podcast on a cliffhanger with an outlandish statement. I don't think Francis Ford Coppola, who directed The Godfather, is a good director. I mean, I'll explain in the next podcast because we're now going to watch episode two and three. Okay, I love the first one. I'm not saying they're bad, yes. but I have a few things to say about them. So tune in next time, guys, for the next podcast when we're going to review Francis Ford Coppola, but also his trilogy of The Godfather. This is High Lazarato. I'm the gentleman, and I'm Papa Smoke. And next time you ask, come give me a little respect, huh? <laughs> I command you, as King of the Britons, to stand aside. I move for no man.